All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I have my, my talking points right here, but I can't see. <laughs> I, I may have to uh, cheat a little. Uh, yeah, welcome to this year's uh, Stephen Muller uh, Distinguished uh, Professor of the Arts Lecture. Uh, it's going to be a, a wonderful uh, presentation, I'm certain. Uh, as many of you uh, likely remember, uh, Dr. Muller uh, was a pretty fascinating man. He held the presidency of Johns Hopkins and Johns Hopkins Hospital at the same time for uh, 11 years. And he was the uh, board of trustee here for, I think, 11 years, nine of which he was chair of our board of trustees. So uh, a, very, a very busy man giving back to his community. Uh, I would like to uh, special, give a special recognition out to Dr. Jill McGovern, uh, Dr. Mueller's uh, uh, spouse. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I, I look forward to seeing you every year. It should be a, another great talk. Um, on the personal side, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, Lisa. I've never seen you give a presentation, so I've missed out, I think. I have some facts about Lisa here. Uh, she joined St. Mary's College at uh, in the art department in 1981, at the age of five, apparently. <laughs> um, she's worked on uh, many uh, celebrated uh, uh, commissions, including uh, she has an installation at uh, the North Concourse of the Reagan uh, National Airport. She has a uh, display called Jetstream on the wall up at BWI. Uh, she's also had her work exhibited in several Washington area institutions, including the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Phillips Collection, the American Institute of Architecture, and the Krieger Museum. Uh, over her career, she has won national grants and awards, including Pollock Krasner Foundation Fellowship, two NEA, NEA excuse me, fellowships, and the Maryland Arts Council Fellowship. Professor Shears, love for the expression of architectural environments has led her to create large-scale sculpture uh, installations and public sculptures that directly integrate into surrounding architecture and landscape features. In addition to the two DC airports, her projects include works created for the Eastern District Federal Courthouse in Brooklyn and the Petworth Metro Station in DC. Her particular um, celebration this year is of, of note in that I have received, sadly, her retirement papers. So that this will be her final year at the college in an official capacity, but I'm confident we will see her uh, frequently nonetheless. I look forward to your talk, and I'm not an artist, everybody knows that about me, I guess, but I've always found your work impressive and really um, something of note and something that I, I told one of my associate deans, I said, I loved it, I don't know what it was supposed to be, but I loved it, and it made me feel good. So I think that's maybe the first purpose of some art. So please uh, join me in welcoming this year's Muller Professor of the Arts, Dr. Lisa Shea. Wow, look at everybody. <laughs> Um, it's so amazing to see everyone here. I can't tell you how much it means to me. Colleagues, students, alums, some came from a very far distance to be here today. It means so much to me, uh, so let me please spend my first talk, part of my talk here just saying some thanks, because I think it's in order. First, I'd like to... Oh, oh sure, now you can. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It just, it just wanted to come on. <laughs> Uh, I will go on as they figure this out. Um, so first I'd like to express my gratitude to Stephen Muller and his family for their support of the faculty at St. Mary's College. I understand I am the fifth Muller Distinguished Professor of the Arts, and all told, the Stephen Muller Distinguished Professorships have sponsored research and creative work of 10 St. Mary's faculty dating back to the awards creation in 2000. In that vein, I would like to dedicate my talk this afternoon to all of the faculty of St. Mary's College. Uh, I believe Stephen Muller understood when he endowed these professorships that the heart and the soul of every school is its faculty. And it has been my privilege to work with, in a way grow up with, 
uh, such an amazing bunch of talented and endlessly committed teachers, scholars, and creative artists. <laughs> I'm particularly honored to be given this recognition knowing that there are many that are just as, if not more so, deserving than I. <laughs> I have the power. <laughs> of all the wonderful colleagues that I've had the privilege to work with, I'd like to take this opportunity, if I may, to say a special thanks to some of those closest to me. First, my current colleagues in the Art and Art History Department, who graciously put up with my loud squawking ways, <laughs> Joe, Emily, Sue, Carrie, and Tristan, and Jesse, thank you. Then there are my close colleagues who have moved to new lives beyond St. Mary's, but will always remain cherished friends and meaningful collaborators, Sandy, Elijah, Colby, and Billy, to name some. And finally, to those special colleagues who have now passed from this world, uh, but were people who deeply shaped and taught me what it meant to be a teacher, a colleague, and a friend. Most of you might not recognize their names, but they all played major roles in making St. Mary's what it is today. Jim Nickel, Henry Rosemont, and now John Underwood. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the college itself. Uh, they have given, this place has given me a home for 39 years, virtually all my adult life, and in doing so has provided me with a type of support and stable context that has made my life as an artist possible. And finally, the last but utterly the opposite of the least, I would like to also recognize and thank my husband and creative partner, Hugh McKay. Uh, much of the commission work you, I will show you today would not have happened without his skilled assistance, keen eye, and support, and what a surprise, endless patience. Thank you. <laughs> So at this moment, coming here today to talk about my work turns out, as Mike said, to be an extra special event for me, because it is both my Mueller lecture and my swan song. Because as it happens, I am indeed retiring in June, making this my 78th and final semester of teaching at St. Mary's College. <laughs> Needless to say, it has put me in a nostalgic frame of mind that has me digging into old file cabinets, unearthing historic documents that include such antiquities as hand-typed syllabi, I mean, hand typed with white out. Yes. So, <laughs> right? Uh, 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 which, by the way, at the time were probably like two short sentence paragraphs, if you can <laughs> believe that. Okay? Uh, simple affairs. Uh, this taking stock has also prompted me to see if I could find some early pictures of me at the college. I didn't find much, because after all, this was well before when cell phones documented every waking moment of our lives. Uh, but here you see me. <laughs> Upon my arrival at the college in the fall of 1981, in my newly acquired garb, <laughs> school spirit, uh, I was all of 25 years old, fresh from graduate school, and I will confess that I did not have a single clue as to what I was doing. Um, so here, hold on, I have to find my clicker now. There we go. That's one thing I haven't located. Ah important clicker. Here I am. Another picture that I found. I had to show you. I couldn't resist. Okay. A feature about me in the Mulberry Tree paper from not, back in 1984. And if you can't imagine how long ago the 80s were, here's a reminder. Note that my feature comes above the topic of the hot vanguard topic of the day, computers proliferate. <laughs> oh, no. It's hard to imagine that I or the publication office thought that these images were appropriate to represent young faculty member in any way, but do check out the St. Mary's College gym shorts and the pearls. <laughs> but enough of memory lane, on to the art. There we go, the art. When I was first musing about what I might want my Mueller lecture to include, I was torn. Should I talk about the pr my process, the proverbial nuts and bolts of planning and building that is literally the making part of sculpture, of being a sculptor, or should I focus on the more idiosyncratic creating part of my practice by talking about the impulses and motivations that give rise to the forms I create? I solved my dilemma by deciding to split the talk into two parts and include a bit of both. This, de this decision struck me as particularly apt because in a way, it reinforces one of my core truths about being a sculptor. There are always, there's always this duality of opposing mindsets. 
On one hand, there is the practical, real world, problem solving, drudge labor part that all art making must deal with, but particularly so with sculpture. On the other, there are the more delicate acts of imagination, getting in touch with what compels, finding form for these impulses, balancing these two things, not letting the practical overwhelm the inventive, and not dreaming up things that can't be built, is something that is an ongoing challenge for me, particularly as my practice includes the intense practical demands of large-scale public works. So I guess I should start at the beginning. It seems right for me to start at the beginning, so to speak, by trying to shed some light on my creative impulses and inclinations. I say try because unlike tangible processes, the nature of one's impulses can be hard to describe, probably because they're, while they're always in force, shaping what we do, they often remain unconscious and reveal themselves, if at all, in fragmented ways. This is particularly true at the beginning of one's artistic practice. As many of my students, artists, student artists, will attest, we are always nagging them to articulate their intentions, and they struggle to do so for good reason. Maybe one of my greatest pleasures of being a senior artist now in my fifth decade of art making, is that I have worked long enough to observe the reoccurring patterns that my impulses and inclinations form. And it is my grasp of these patterns that constitute a modicum of self-understanding, though still difficult to talk about in concrete ways. So where does one's inclinations come from? How and when does an artist find their specific voice? Why are we drawn to make the specific things we make? Why engage certain types of forms and not others? It is, something, is it something hardwired inside of us? I am certainly not one to buy into the idea that talent is innate rather than learned. After all, I am an art teacher. But while skill is one thing, creative predilections are another. I have seen over and over beginning students, artists, make artworks that from day one are distinctively and unmistakably theirs, manifesting qualities that persist in their work in one form or another throughout their lives. So what are my predilections? Maybe first and foremost, it was very clear right from my own beginnings that I was drawn to sculpture as my medium of choice. When other kids drew and colored and made pictures, I was playing with stuff, exploring the physical properties of materials by melting glass tubes, sanding wood grain, pouring plaster into boxes. And to illustrate, here's an image of my oldest surviving sculpture that I unearthed in my parents' attic just this summer, <laughs> thanks to mom, <laughs> saving everything. Uh, later, my affinity for the physical became less about the process of making things and more about experiencing the results. I found myself attracted to the way physical objects and spaces could push and pull one's body, uh, create distinct internal sensations, even in the absence of direct contact. My most seminal artistic moments or intense experiences of this sort. In this way, they constitute my creative sources. I found them both in natural and in man-made environments. Of the man-made, one of my deep and abiding passions is for architecture, particularly all types, any type of sacred architecture. Because these, the creators of these structures, be they ancient temple platforms, Buddhist stupas, Hindu shrines, or Catholic churches, all understood and capitalized on the expressive and visceral effects of these spaces. I'm talking about experiences of space that change you forever. Like the first time I experienced the magnificent crossing in the middle of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. The entire building is, a stunning, is stunning on all fronts, but its glory is its central crossing that houses the high altar under Bernini's canopy. You go there by walking down the nave. Here we are, the nave. Um, a showstopper in its own right, with its knockout white and gold ornament. But it is the moment you reach that exact spot where the dome blasts into view that causes, caused my heart to leap, making my body feel unmoored from its earthly bounds as this muscular space lifts not with the lightness of air, but with tremendous force of human determination committed to breaking the limits of gravity. And we have Michelangelo to thank 
for creating this worldly manifestation of ascension. Another example, maybe at the opposite end of the spectrum, is my experience of Hindu rock-cut temples. Unlike most architecture that is built by erecting walls and enclosing space, these cave temples are unique places where space is created by carving away solid stone. The effect is that air feels palpably dense, more like matter than the absence of it. Likewise, one's body feels compressed and drawn into the earth uh, by the forces of gravity and mass. I will forever remember the first one I stepped into in Alora back in 1987. It literally knocked the breath out of me. Overwhelming and electric, I felt a heightened sense of my own presence as if it was the first time I was truly experiencing my own mass, which is a very exciting thing for a sculptor. <laughs> These experiences of muscular gesture and weightedness meant a great deal to me, particularly in a time period in the 1980s and 90s. It was a time when I was experiencing significant depression with a strong physical component. And although I didn't recognize it at the time, my own condition was probably what made these experiences so compelling to me and likewise formed my creative impulses. It showed up in my work in a number of ways. I've selected here a few examples of my early work where I hope you can all clearly see this sense of weightedness at play. The moving experience I was having in some of the greatest edifices of world architecture inspired me in my much more only modest way to make my own spaces, either by creating spaces from scratch, such as these early ones from the 1980s that you see on the left that are made out of rusted, soldered sheets of rusted steel, or later when opportunities presented themselves to modify existing spaces, such as the one here on the right, uh, titled Tiara, made in 1992, that was built into the existing entrance of the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. At the same time, I was also creating smaller wall-hung works, what I refer to as my domestic scale. And while they are not whole environments, I hope you can see in them a similar type of muscularity, where gesture happens, not with ease, but rather with a degree of force that if just for a moment, overcomes gravity and allows us to leap, what the World War II poet pilot John Maggie beautifully described as, quote, slipping the surly bonds of Earth, unquote. But this particular paradigm of matter as dense and weighted has not been a constant in my life. In fact, my changing attractions to different types of forms have become a sublimated indicator of my states of mind and feelings. For instance, while mass and density were my predilections in earlier in my life, one of my more recent compulsions is for flow. Almost the opposite of mass, so I'm comparing mass to flow, almost the opposite of mass, flow is when the solid becomes the fluid, when things move with grace and ease in a continuum that often leads to their dissipation not rather than their concretization. Not a solidifying presence, but rather about letting one go. As I said, earlier, I said earlier that my experiences of certain natural and man-made forms have been key sources for realizing, if not forming, my uh, uh, impulses. In the case of flow, I will share with you another of my seminal experiences, this time a natural place, where rock flows like water. I've spent a great deal of time out in the Southwest, drawn by my love of rocks and the amazing environments they create, but nothing I've seen uh, out there beats my experience of the slot canyon called Lower Antelope near L Lake Powell in northern Arizona. Slot canyons are, just like all other canyons in the southwest, created by erosion. But in the case of a slot canyon, such as Antelope, quickly rushing water cuts deep channels into the sandstone rock, creating narrow passageways carved by the swirling eddies and paths of water. Thus, the spaces left behind become the physical manifestation of that flow. On the surface, as shown in this image, lower antelope doesn't look like much, but slip into the narrow passage, and you can see someone poking out of the narrow passage there, uh, um, and behold. You need to know that these photos are not doctored in or tinted in any way. It just looks like this. Uh, so amazing, so endlessly fluid, 
it almost makes one want to give up making sculpture because it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> Having this experience in 2011 was not what started my compulsion for flow. Flow began to manifest itself in my work as early as 2000 and came into full fruition about five years later. These works, uh, like my earlier ones, are still made from thin sheet metal, but now I'm using copper sheet, patinated in rich green, greens, a switch that I also think was part of my new flow paradigm, because flow for me is inescapably connected to a sense of growth and organicism in the same way that rust connects with the earth and mass. But it wasn't until I had the opportunity to work with a type of organic forms that only modeling create can create, that is, sculptures whose forming begins with malleable materials such as clay, that my propensity for flow found its full voice. First, with these small bronzes, which I used as the occasion to coax out and develop my impulse for the sensual fleshiness of organic form. Then later, when I had the great fortune to be awarded public commissions with large enough budgets to afford creating casts to try it on a much larger scale. The interesting thing about these works, these larger, later works, is that their display of flow is not just a quality of their form, but also an essential part of their narrative content. Beacon, you see here on the far uh, left, not right, uh, uh, was my first large bronze cast commission, completed in 2005, but designed in 2001, in a, the few months just following the destruction, the incineration of the World Trade Towers in New York, which is only a few miles from the site. Um, its flow is about reclaiming the emblematic power of the flame as a life force, rather than one of death and destruction. Or jet stream, shown on the top here, along with its other half slipstream not shown here, created in 2006 for the Southwest Terminal BWI Airport, celebrates flight as a dance with air currents. Um, um, or New Leaf, here at the bottom, a sculpture that sits at the entrance of the Petworth Metro Station in DC, where both the poem and the sculpture reference the flow of time that connects transient human presence with the ever-changing cycles of nature. Most of my recent work is akin to flow, but goes a bit farther. And if I had to name its material quality, it would be the ethereal or vaporous. Uh, leading me to realize, by the way, that the, tra the trajectory of my creative life could be summed up in the arc of matter itself from solid to fluid to gas. Very nice. <laughs> All I can say about my compulsion for the vaporous is that it coincides in a t in a, with a time in my life when personal loss is more prevalent. Completed over the past five years ago or so, this is a series of works made from very diverse materials, but all with the same simple title, Gone. The initial works in this series arose from contemplating form in its endless flux, as seen here expressed in video, in sculpture, and in photographs. Uh, from there, I dematerialized further by removing all solid surface in favor of meshes whose shadows often have more presence than the wire forms that cast them. Far from the forceful physicality of the spaces that inspired me in my youth, I now spend my time observing vaporous immaterial entities such as smoke, clouds, and airstreams. And if I had to pick a single spatial experience, a place that epitomizes my current predilection for the vaporous, it would be the fog banks that regularly engulf our family home on the coast of northern Maine. Yes, the experience is one of nothingness, but so surprisingly full of subtle variations of light and color that I mesmerize for hours on end, an activity I definitely plan to do more of real soon. <laughs> so there you have it. I've taken you all the way to nothingness. So I guess there is nowhere else to go but back to the hardcore reality. So now with, I will pivot with no segue at all, except to say that sometimes the pragmatic mind can be a very welcome relief to the vague musings of the creative mind. So as promised, I will proceed to conclude my talk with a brief glimpse into the practical aspects of making things. Hopefully, this abrupt shift will not seem too absurd but, I, but do know 
that if you find it jarring, that is exactly what I often experience as I, as I go back and forth between the two mindsets. I began my talk today saying that one of my challenges is finding a balance between the artistic side of my creative process and the practical demands that making physical objects entail. My love of grand spatial effect, for better or for worse, has led me into a practice where I regularly create large-scale public sculptures. In this golden age of public art, there are many artists who tackle these challenges by assembling large teams of talented collaborators, each bringing a special skill set to the complex task of building big public things. Far from the stereotype of the artist as a free soul mining the depths of their imagination, creating large-scale public works can often be more like running a business uh, with project managers, engineers, lawyers, and production crews. My practice has stayed on a more DIY, do-it-yourself level where I and my partner, Hugh, handle most aspects using the occasional subcontractor when necessary. And that means I end up wearing many hats, many of which are far from the role of artist. To give a glimpse into what creating one of these projects entail, I will walk through and illustrate the steps of one such project, the sculptures I created for the Southwest Terminal at BWI Airport in 2002. I will first skip over all the tedious aspects of the, act the application and selection process that gets one the commission in the first place. It's the lighting, it's the ghosts, right, in the first place. I don't know if it, well, we can go on, right? Uh, uh, the first place, with the design process. I'm going to begin with the design process. For me, there are two aspects of designing that are totally intermeshed. One is establishing an overall vocabulary form, and the other is arriving at the configuration these forms will take. Both must be figured out through a careful consideration of a project's context. Both its programmatic identity, what happens there, who sees it, uh, what type of frame, mind frame are people in, etc. And the physical condition of its site, the architectural configuration of the space, uh, the, lighting, the light quality, the way people move through the space, etc. In the case of this project, the general location for artwork at the terminal had already been predetermined, and I had to design within that given parameter. I had to first study all the potential, in other projects, sometimes I have to study all of the potential art sites and propose a specific location. So in this one, I did not have to do that. Um, uh, in addition to context, there are any number of other givens, a project's practical parameters that can limit and inform design, such as budget, time frame, client's tastes, and public expectations. So here, what you're looking at is one of my typical design boards, where I'm collecting a number of visual images that help me develop what I'm calling my form vocabulary. Some are new to this project, while others have been in my sketchbook for years, and some are actually pictures of my own past work. Um, I've always collected images like this. M many artists do. But I used to do it in a much more haphazard way. Uh, but then I realized that assembling uh, a, some, you know, making assemblages like this could serve as a very effective communication tool when explaining one's artistic uh, intentions to clients and public approval committees. Uh, in this slide, I jump forward to images of the completed sculpture juxtaposed to some of the images from my design board to give you a quick idea of what I mean by form vocabulary, building a form vocabulary. I hope this side-by-side -side comparison illustrates how my shapes and surfaces can be informed by a variety of identities, yet not literally represent any one of them. This gets to the heart of one of my primary goals as a so-called abstract artist, that is to create forms that are not identity-less, but rather to be able to manifest multiple identities simultaneously, never uh, settling as one item or another. As for the design configuration, I often begin by sketching. Being a sculptor that I am, I need to see things in real space, and thus I prefer sketching in 3D, not on a flat page. In this slide, you can see me following my mandate of always designing in context. I have made a simple foam core version of the terminal walls to serve as my 3D sketch space on which I pin bits of clay to begin visualizing possible options. 
it is a small half inch model that allows me to see the design as a whole and not worry too early about details. I can easily make changes by cutting, adding, moving the bits around. In short, it is an approach that lets me play, observe, test, and adjust easily so my creative impulses can flow without much hindrance. Once I have the overall idea, I need to go farther into the visualization process, uh, both to test how it might look in the larger context of the space, but maybe more important so I can effectively show others how it will look. Uh, this is an added chore of public projects. It isn't just oneself that needs to understand the proposed design uh, and be convinced of its effect effectiveness. Uh, one often needs to convince diverse types of audiences, uh, including approval committees, the general public, and even building functionaries. As is the case with most of the projects I do, uh, the site where the sculpture will live has yet to be built. So I must rely on physical models and digital renderings to fully visualize my designs. <laughs> They're testing me. I've had to teach, I can, I can lecture on in any condition, everyone knows that. <laughs> <laughs> Unflappable. Uh, so I've had to teach myself the complex task of 3D CAD modeling, requiring advanced digital skills and the ability to read architectural plans provided by project architects and engineers. <laughs> it's another test. Once the design is completed and approved, a whole host of bureaucratic functions must be addressed. You like my illustration? Bureaucratic functions. Uh, including everything from the complex process of contracting to establishing schedules to e meeting insurance requirements. Beyond these administrative tasks, the work of site design collaboration with project architects and engineers must be done to arrive at things like effective lighting plans and reconfiguring site structures to accommodate the sculpture installation. Each of these tasks often, very often, fraught in any number of ways requires endless negotiations, meetings, and documentation. It is not my favorite part of the process. It's more like being a department chair. Enough said. <laughs> Back to the art part. A next step would be to, uh, in the fabrication process, begins by creating fully detailed sculptures based on the general uh, overall concept design. But this, uh, because this can't be done effectively at full size yet, remember some of the parts we're making are going to be over 10 feet tall, I sculpted in a three inch scale. The first model was half inch scale, this is three inch scale. Uh, big enough to sculpt all details of the form and surface, but small enough to be able to see the forms in relationship to each other. Creating these three inch models is where the real sculpting happens. After this point in the process, uh, it will only be about precise replication. Even at this smaller size, they cannot just be made in clay, so they are first rough carved in pink insulation foam and then finished with clay details. That's what you're seeing here. Note how, again, my commitment to sculpting in context uh, in the context of their site. Uh, has, at this larger scale, required me to build eight-foot wall, tall walls in my studio and add large prints of architectural features to mimic a three-inch scale version of the site. These three-inch scale sculptures then become the basis for reproduction at full size. The scaling up is done not by eye, but rather through a strict mathematical process where XYZ points from the three inch scale version are exactly located in the full size space using relative 3D grids as a way to measure and find points. So here is Hugh using his background skills in theatrical fabrication to scale up and carve very large and dense blocks of foam that then get covered in clay to become what are called the sculpture patterns. Um, here they are finished, sculpture patterns. Patterns are the final sculptural form from which molds will be taken. Here you see two of the six patterns that ultimately combine together to form over 300 running feet of sculpture. Uh, and now they're ready to be sent to the foundry. Um, so, while Hugh is busy carving these patterns, because he doesn't let me help, no, I am not at home kicking back. I am working on details such as designing the various brackets and structural details that specify how the structure will bolt to the terminal walls. Oh, my video isn't running there. That's too bad. It's, it wiggles a little bit. Is it, is it? Oh, it is? Okay, cool. 
it's this is okay. So each bracket design must be drawn out and submitted to engineers so they can run stress tests. That's what that little video is. It's a stress test uh, and pass uh, reviews to certify the, the, them as structurally viable. On with the fabrication process. Having completed the patterns, they then travel up to Baltimore to our foundry. We do not have our own foundry, and they begin their multi-step efforts. I don't have time today to describe the lost wax casting process in full, but I can at least name the steps. First, molds are formed around the patterns. That's what you're seeing at the top. These molds, as shown on top, uh, two images, are then used to slush cast hollow wax parts. And that's why it, it looks red in the interior there. Uh, these wax pieces are then attached to frames. Sprues and gates are added which are the things that create the pathways by which molten metal is poured in and air escapes. So that's what you're seeing here is the mold, them being cast in wax, and then they assemble the wax, take it back apart, and put it on carriages. In this slide, you see the same red wax part now having been dipped in a liquid ceramic and reinforced with chicken wire. Once set in an oven, the ceramic hardens and liquid m wax melts out, leaving the void that will become filled with a molten metal. Here seen in the lower images being melted and then poured into the now hollow ceramic casts. Once the metal is slowly cooled in its sandbox, its ceramic mold needs to be chipped away, the sprues cut off. One is left with aluminum parts, in this case, because it was an aluminum cast, as seen in the upper left. Not even near done. Now all of the remaining parts need to be welded back together. Weld seams need to be chased and detailed to match back to the surface of the casts. Structural hanging brackets need to be built and welded in place. Hanging patterns need to be made. And finally, a patina applied to all surfaces. In this case, the patina is accomplished with tinted waxes, making the aluminum, aluminum look more like hammered pewter that reveals the detailed surface textures, and that's what it looks like in the, in the end. Last but not least is the installation itself. More hard work requiring hanging large paper patterns to locate the exact position where hardware needs to be inserted in the wall. Uh, one of the things that I have to say I'm most proud of with this sculpture, if, I don't know if anyone has, if, when you go and see it at some point, um, is uh, how you can't see any of the brackets, any of the structuring from where you stand. It looks like it's just floating there. Uh, and that takes a lot of planning and a lot of work. Uh, I, have to, I have to admit, I hate installations, as she will tell you. They freak me out, no matter how carefully we have planned. So are you exhausted? <laughs> I am just thinking about it <laughs> all over again. The process is so prolonged and so arduous. This project took three years, and it was on an extremely tight schedule. Uh, with no breaks, no vacations for, I mean, literally for three years. Uh, uh, it could take me at least a year or more to recover, get enough distance so I can finally look at the results with pleasure and not as a reminder of all the fatigue and anxiety that went into the process. So there you have it. Two very different but yet interdependent aspects of my artistic practice that taken together tell my story of finding form. Thank you. She's willing to take some questions if anyone has any. It's, it's in northern Arizona, uh, near Lake Powell. So it's in what they call Four Corners, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, and U southern Utah. And it's a fabulous, you should, absolutely should go. Wonderful trip. Yes. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Ryan. Particularly with the uh, Baltimore installation, were you ever surprised by the final finish, the appearance, now that you've envisioned it over so much time and you've, you had to come up with the the lighting in your mind and, and, and how that's going to play on your on the materials. Is it ever, when it was finally on the wall, I noticed a little bit of a difference between what it looked like in the shop uh, and then what it looked like on the wall. 
So yeah. I was curious what you Well, I can answer, I, I feel compelled to answer that in different ways. On one hand, sometimes I have models that are so exact that I can't tell the difference between a photograph of my model and the sculpture when it's installed. On the other hand, um, it is very different. Uh, no matter how much you plan for and, and, and try to imagine what it's going to look like and visualize that. Uh, I, he will tell you that I have a famous habit of like not wanting to go necessarily to go out of my way to see my sculptures installed because all, a lot of times you show up and the lights aren't working. They've let the lights go off or some sort of tragic thing like that, so I always have to go with, like with, you know, braced for some problem. So that's another aspect. But when I do go to BWI, I, and wait on the security line because I have the best audience ever because they just stand there waiting to get through security for like half an hour. And I'll come up to the security guy and I'll say, so you stand next to this thing all day long. You know, like, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I said, well, I made that. <laughs> <laughs> That's like my moment of whatever. So. <laughs> you like to fly out of BWI a lot. <laughs> well, uh, now, now I do. I have recently <laughs> taken a habit to it. Other questions? Yeah. Dan. Have you ever been tempted to try out 3D computer modeling, like for virtual reality or anything like that? Well, wouldn't it be great? Yeah. Um, uh, I have taken some of my smaller pieces, the resin pieces that I showed at the end. Um, I have had some of them 3D scanned, but they were scanned objects. I did not make them in the computer. And, the, and that is, I wish I could because it would save me thousands of dollars just for that extra <laughs> process. Uh, my answer would be that even though I work a great deal in the 3D CAD environment, I never feel the real object. You see view, 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 you can rotate around it, uh, but it doesn't, it just, for me, I'm old, maybe I'm old fashioned, I just can't quite feel it. So I've never, I've done a lot of renderings, like for instance in the BWI piece, I did that little, I did the three inch model, but it wasn't a finished model. I mean, it, you know, it wasn't the whole building. Uh, and so all I had was those renderings to know what it would look like, uh, but I still need to make it in 3D space. At least that's what I found. Do you have a favorite part of the process? Like, do you, like the brainstorming? <laughs> do you know what I'm gonna say? <laughs> Being done. <laughs> Because then you go, wow, and as I said, a couple of years out, and you go back to the thing and you go, excellent, you know, like, but before that, you can't, because it's every, I see every mistake I made, I think of every pain it gave me, uh, so it does, and literally when I said it takes me some time to recover, it does. Do you have a favorite picture that you Do I have, no. <laughs> I, I, I can't, you know, um, no. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful lecture. I know my husband would be just delighted That's and thrilled. would have learned as much as I have. Uh, I, I'm curious about how you get the public commissions. And to me, this means that St. Mary's College is out there in the world, and your work is out there, too, at the same time. So I'm just wondering how you, how you are called upon to do these, these works. Well, it's an interesting question, because a while ago, can I say in the old days, dates me, um, that a lot of times people would, you know, um, selection committees, they would, they can, might have an open call or they might actually hire an art consultant to call in known, you know, so they're hiring someone to say, here, I've got a good idea of 20 or so people that might suit this commission. Now, in this day and age with the internet, the open calls are international. I was a finalist in something for downtown DC that literally had 3,000 applicants. Mm -hmm. I was selected as one of 75 finalists and the winner was from the Netherlands. So I don't know if I would have ever had a career uh, in a way because I don't know how you have a presence when there's no lo lo localness. Uh, but yeah, a lot of the commissions I got had a lot to do with my work being shown in DC at galleries and so commissioned, uh, uh, cl commissioning clients would come and see them or art consultants that were informing the commissioning clients knew of my work. So I think that would be probably the, you know, the most common way that I came to that. But yes, St. Mary's is out there in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell the story of my most recent commission that I'm in the midst, I mean, right, I've just begun. Um, so the client 
is this head of a very, very large development company in Bethesda, Maryland, and they build many, many buildings. And he knows what he likes, uh, uh, and that's that. And so we w got into a very protracted problem of what size. I designed the sculpture. He loved the sculpture. I envisioned it at nine and a half to ten foot tall. He envisioned it more like four foot tall. And, uh, and so there was a tremendous back and forth. And that is just an example of when, uh, um, because when you go public, it's not your own choices. You have to work with others. And I hate to use the word compromise. And the good news is, is that we're building the sculpture at seven and a half feet. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and it wasn't really, I tried really hard to convince him, but it was actually his vice president at the development company that finally had the wherewithal to compel him and to have him reconsider his decision. But yes, that's the hardest part, is working outside of your own head. Well, I'll say to continue the t conversations down the hall, we have yes. a reception down in Aldham Lounge, down this way and to the left. Uh, so again, please join me for one last round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank